you know, normally I like to, normally I like to ask the guests a little bit about themselves. And you see um, uh, some of uh, Chris's information here, but I think it'd just be great to know a little bit beyond just kind of the uh, sort of the, the LinkedIn profile uh, sort of uh, explanation. But Chris, tell us a little bit about your journey into becoming a nonprofit leader, number one. Just kind of, we're going to set the stage to get to know you first. I think it's important to know what, what, why you and, and the arts, how did, how did you, how did, how did you get, get to where you are now? I think, and, and then we'll, we'll get into things. Because I think it's real important to know a little bit about the speaker, because then you can tell where the passions lie and, and, and why the interest. Well, first, thank you so much uh, to you, Rocky, and for Charlotte Mecklenburg Collaborative for having me this um, this morning. My journey in the cultural sector really began um, as a child growing up in Augusta, Georgia. Um, mm. I went to a performing arts school, John S. Davidson Fine Arts School, from sixth to twelfth grade. My passion was ballet. I studied that was my track. Um, so I had ballet every morning at at, uh, at school, and then after school, I would go to Augusta Ballet. Um, for classes and my goal was to become um, to go to New York and be a dancer with Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater or Dance Theater Harlem or, or you know a company like that. Um, but I ended up uh, and actually the other interesting thing is is that growing up in Augusta I actually had a poster of North Carolina Dance Theater on my wall which is now wow. Charlotte LA. So wow. it's really interesting for me now the yeah. come full circle and, you know, leading an organization that supports and funds, um, you know, Charlotte Ballet. But came here to Charlotte to attend Johnson C. Smith University. While Johnson C. Smith University at that time did not have a dance program, you know, I would, you know, choreograph the Miss JCSU coronation, you know, still continue my connection with, dan with, with uh, dance. And then after graduating, um, my first job actually was at Johnson C. Smith, but stayed there for a few years. And then, um, began uh, working at a uh, community school of the arts, which is now Arts Plus. Okay. And which was funded by ASC and was there for a few years and then uh, joined ASC in 2002 and have been uh, here for 19 years, been able to grow within the organization. But it's been really interesting to see the cultural community kind of grow and change over those years. Mm -hmm. but that's, I really say that's, that's my journey and how I ended up having a career in the arts. Okay. And then um, you and then how long have you been at the at, at Arts and Science Council? I've been at ASC for 19 years, and majority of those roles before becoming president has been in the public relations space because that is my background as a public relations practitioner. Okay, so I know like a lot of folks have heard the term, you know, Arts and Science Council. Maybe a lot of folks, uh, uh, you know, um, have read it in the news or or just hear maybe pass by something that you really like and said sponsored by. Arts and Science Council, but for those of the folks in the audience who aren't super familiar with the Arts and Science Council, maybe you could maybe give maybe a, a little bit of a snapshot of its of its history in the in the Charlotte art scene and, and sort of its evolution um, from its beginnings and to where it is today to kind of give us some context and um, about what Charlotte's art scene looked like and how it's looking now and how ASC has played a role in that. Sure. So ASC was, was founded in 1958 um, to really raise dollars to support eight organizations mm. um, that exist today. And those organizations were founded in white Eurocentric, you know, culture. Mm. Um, so when you range from the, you know, the Charlotte Symphony to the Theater Charlotte, um, Children's Theater Charlotte and the Op Opera Carolina and others. And so that was how the, the organization was created. Um, to really raise money for them to be a clearinghouse for various of cult cultural events. And over the years, um, the organization has changed in its approach of now investing in creative individuals, supporting arts education, um, really being a resource hub and a leader for the cultural sector um, in the Charlotte Mecklenburg area. We were designated by the city of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County to serve as their office of cultural um, affairs because Historically, that's within government, but yeah. um, but that they want led us designated us to do that work, and so we've been doing that work for mm -hmm. over you know forty something years. Well, that's interesting. So it started off in in nineteen what forty eight. So that's almost what nineteen fifty eight. Fifty eight. Nineteen fifty eight. So it's like what sixty years. Sixty or so? years ago. Yes. Yeah, something like that. And so and it was designated in nineteen fifty eight to fundraise for I guess what we may call the legacy art 
organizations, mm-hmm. right? And yes. and what were sort of the, I know it, like it, it's fraternities and sorority call them the divine nine, but here's like, who are like the elite eight? I guess, you know, like, who are the elite eight here? Yeah, so if I can remember, um, it's Mint Museum, Opera mm-hmm. Carolina, uh, the Charlotte Oratorio Singers, which is now part of the Charlotte Symphony, mm-hmm. the Charlotte Symphony. Okay. Um, they're now Carolina Voices that does the Singing Christmas Tree. Okay. Um, Children's Theater of Charlotte, Theater Charlotte. And I know it's always, it's one more that I always forget, but those are some of the, orga- mm-hmm. of the organizations. Yeah, so these, and, and most of these are- Oh, and Discovery Place, I'm sorry. Discovery, Discovery Place, which was Charlotte Nature Museum. Ah. And these are all the ones, I mean, most of these, and, and I think most people who like have either been a tourist in Charlotte or live in Charlotte, these are the ones that are more or less populated throughout uptown Charlotte, right? Yes. Yes. And, and most of them are probably, I think I, I heard it, a lot of them, these are what, city-owned buildings that they've been, because this is long, this is old school, like, you know, this is, you know, this was the, this was the set, because again, we're talking about 1958 we hadn't even had like you know uh you know there, there's a lot going on in 1958 you know leading into a modern history right and yes. and so i think that a lot of this discussion you know because sometimes the idea is um when you're looking at the at a problem you have to look at the root of the problem and a lot of times the root of the problem is it's is kind of housed in the history right yes. i think those who do not know their history are quote unquote, doomed to repeat said history and so that's why I kind of wanted to kind of burrow down into this period because again, the contextualization of Arts and Science Council, you know, was was really created in its intent by its, you know, the creator's intent, as the union you know, law, you know, we sometimes talk about that, was to service these more or less uptown, um, you know, sort of, you know, the symphony, the opera, the the, the art museums, you know, things that I guess um, are traditionally seen as the, the the higher arts or the the, the fine arts or or, or, or or things of of that nature and um and i think that's and i think that that i think is kind of the I, to me from my perspective or from, from my review of everything a lot of the root of some of this conflict comes from sort of the in the original intent and versus a evolving progressing charlotte and charlotte art scene and i think that there's that that sort of square peg in the round, you know, round hole situation of you've got, you've got these legacy organizations that have kind of expected X amount of dollars or a certain type of support or a certain type of uh, prestige in a sense. And then we've got a changing, uh, a, a changing uh, Charlotte. And so to those of us, you know, because again, maybe if you are not as familiar with the full diversity and range of the current Charlotte art scene, um, from, from your perspective, how, how do you see like Charlotte's art scene? Is it just these eight or is it, do we have more? Cause I mean, I think I know the answer, but you know, it's, uh, maybe yeah. you can kind of like talk about the panoply, just the, the, the pure richness of Charlotte's art scene beyond these sort of elite eight. Yes, well, well, Charlotte art scene is very diverse. It spans across Mecklenburg County. It's not just uptown. And just to be clear, you know, the Mint Museum was not always uptown. They started on, you know, off on Randolph Road. And, mm-hmm. you know, during 58, uptown was not, of course, not vibrant when, it went, you know, how, how it is today. Um, but our cultural community is very diverse. Um, it spans across Mecklenburg County, including the six suburban towns. Um, a lot of creative, and I always say the, the um, kind of the organizations are the foundation of the cultural sector, but it's the creative individuals that are the lifeblood of the cultural sector because they are the ones that activate spaces, uh, traditional spaces as well as non-traditional spaces. And we have been doing, ASC has been doing a lot of work, um, working with community and listening and learning about how residents want the cultural sector to serve them. And they want relevant and diverse and innovative cultural experiences for a changing population. And the other big thing is, is that they want experiences close to where they live. Mm -hmm. Um, I understand that you have to come uptown for the major exhibitions and shows like 
the color purple on Broadway or Hamilton. Um, but I'm talking to you this morning from Steel Creek and, you know, there's residents here. I would like experiences for my two young sons and my nephews and other people um, that live here. So the, the, the sector is not just uptown. It is across Mecklenburg County. And that's what ASC's focus is on, serving the residents of, Mecklen of Charlotte Mecklenburg, including the, the towns. So yeah, I think that's important to know because again, when ASC was started, there was really sort of a designated eight art organizations that still in some way, shape or form, uh, you know, are, are existing today, thrive today, you know, and that's, you know, and, and I mean, that's kind of what their purpose was. But a as you mentioned, you know, I think that there has been, you know, uh, an evolution, you know, a growth. I mean, our, our country, our society has, has evolved and art it's both a, a mover of that change and also a reflection of that change. And so I think that's, I, I think that's really key. Um, I know that you had published um, a, a blog and you sent that to us uh, a, a, a couple of months ago. And in it, I'm really struck by a quote that, that, um, that you had, well, it's a quote that you had quoted from uh, Professor Eddie Glaude. If you, maybe you've seen him on like TV, you know, he's, he's pretty famous, <laughs> but he has a book called Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. And, and the first chapter of the book is titled The Lie. And I think this is a great quote that kind of, I mean, you know, we're, we're definitely, get, we're going to get into it. <laughs> so, so, so here's our quote here. The lie is more properly several sets of lies with a single purpose a, quote, value gap of an idea that in America, white lives have always mattered more than the lives of others. Then the lie is a broad and powerful architecture of false assumptions by which the value gap is maintained. These narrative assumptions that support the everyday order of American life, which means we breathe them like air, we count them as truths, we absorb them into our character. And then in this, you say, you see the lie in action every day even in the arts and cultural sector. So I'd love to give you the opportunity to expand and kind of explain um, what, how, you see the, how you see this quote and how it affects our current understanding of the art scene, or just maybe just <laughs> everything in general, probably, but, but maybe the art scene sure. and then we'll maybe have a more philosophical discussion later. <laughs> sure, sure. And but before I get into that, just to say, you know, ASC has continued to broaden its reach as it relates to when we were doing operating support grants. So it would be emerging grassroots organizations right. to that commitment to what residents said they were from grassroots organizations to mid-sized organizations to the major organizations. But I ask if uh, Christina can uh, advance the slide. So what you see here to me is the lie at work. Um, I see the lie happening in the cultural sector because there are certain organizations um, that people that you know people and I think including ASC historically have said mattered more mattered more than others, and so this is an, um, a, a graphic that is in ASC's cultural equity report um, that shows that due to our historical grant making practices, you know, non-organizations have received more in operating support grants, which is, was our largest grant making program, um, than all ALANA organizations combined. And when we say ALANA, we mean organizations that are led for or for um, people that are of African, um, Latina, Latina, Asian, Arab, and Native American um, descent or groups. But, but this chart represents um, you know, who's gotten, who has benefited the most and who hasn't, and that those, um, those nine organizations have received more in funding than, um, than a lot of organizations combined. A lot of organizations only represents 3.4% of the total dollars awarded from 1991 to, you know, to 2020. So, you know, um, this is a visual that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, they don't like it, but it's really important to tell the truth. And there's another quote in that blog post that um, from um, John Meacham that says, history is not a GPS, it is a diagnostic guide. And what we were doing in the cultural equity report is really telling our truth and seeing, uh, you know, being that diagnostic guide as to what are the issues, what is the root cause of the issue, and what are we doing to move forward to become a more equitable organization uh, for the sector. And so, um, 
I really recommend that people um, read the report um, because we also had, you know, during that time, it did make people uncomfortable. And in that blog post, I talk about a, a experience that I had with a president of a legacy organization um, about, you know, about their his take on the report. The other thing is that the report, yes, it talks about our history, but it also talks about what we have been doing over the past six to seven years to becoming a more equitable organization and kind of some goals and things that we have um, moving forward. Um, because the media focused so much on um, ASC's apology, because we did apologize in the report for um, our history of, in, of inequities and lifting more cult you know, cultures more than others, um, they focused on the apology and not really about what's in the report. So we decided to have a session. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I was, yeah, I was going to say, because I think this is important, this report is that, because if you think about ASC is a, is a it, in some respects, a legacy organization in and of yes. itself. You know, many nonprofits yes. are not around that were started in 1958. I mean, it is, this is a legit nonprofit, right? I mean, this is, it's, yes. a, it's as much a legacy as any of these other organizations in Absolutely. and of itself. And by that, you know, I think, you know, my understanding and experience and everyone who's involved in nonprofit sector is that, you know, you can have a very strong, dynamic, and courageous executive director, but you have to have a board, right? A board that will mm -hmm. at least support um, even, because you can have the strongest director and the board's asleep or is not against it. Everything shuts down. This is a very revolutionary, and I don't know if I, I am, I, I'm not really mincing words when, it, when, you, when you really look at it in the context of a longstanding organization, such as the Arts and Science Council, doing sort of a deep dive, really, um, and it's kind of unprecedented in many respects that, that this organization and its board, and I think, you know, obviously the you know, way things have planned out, but I think from my perspective, you know, I, I, I give a lot of um, kudos to, to you and, and that board, because that's, that's courageous to be able to really, to, to really dig into that. And so really, my question is, obviously we're gonna get into it, is that, what what factors was it certain board members or was it just something from the community how did how did where did the support how did you get the majority of this board to support this type of report and this type of sure. self inquiry in an organization sure so in um in 20 in june of 2019 ASC's board of directors approved a cultural equity statement for um, for the organization. Okay. And in the journey of getting to that, um, to the approval and adoption of that statement, we even had Eddie Torres, who's over Grantmakers in the Arts, to come down um, and talk to the board about the importance of equity. Again, we have been doing this work kind of six to seven years, but we wanted a statement to really um, kind of solidify and publicly state the work that we, that we are doing and our commitment. So I will never forget at that June board meeting, after it was um, approved and adopted, the board said, if we are committed to this work, then it is important that we annually report on this work um, mm -hmm. to the community and what we are what we are doing. And that is really what led to the inaugural equity report. And, and the thing is that sometimes Charlotte Lutt has a history of talking about the shiny and new, and not just Charlotte, but a lot of people like to talk about the shiny and new and do not like to go back and talk about history. And for, and as the leader of the cultural equity report, um, it was really important to me to say, we're gonna go back in history and, and tell the truth and then lead in our steps and missteps of what we have been doing to become a more uh, equitable organization. So you are absolutely right. It's really important to have a board that supports the executive director or president and really stands by and also understands this work. Mm -hmm. um, because even in our board packets, we are presenting things differently so that people understand who's getting funded, who's not getting funded, what were the eligible applications, you know, where they're coming from, you know, et cetera. So, Thank you for lifting that up because that's that is really important and great yeah, for that. No, I, have I mean, that, that mean I don't see anybody else doing something like that, right? You know, because there's a, I mean, it, and and I think courage should be called out. You know, I think that, and it's tough, and it's the hard road. You know, and I, and it's a surprising, you know, because again, if you look at the history, it's not like you know, if you were to ask anyone ten years ago or fifteen years ago for sure, is ASC going to you know take a dynamic step into like to, to address 
equity and ju- justice, you know, I probably, you know, probably be fool to take that bet, right? You know, but right. but but something has occurred, you know, and I again, you know, it could be that symbiotic relationship between if you are a community connected organization, and as it sounds like the history of ASC, you know, you start off with the elite eight, but then you start it as as Cheryl is growing, you're seeing the diversity of cultures and and and, and youth and class and you know identities and it's a whole stew of of of, of just art and I mean yeah you can show how my experience like a stew of art right that's what I call it, you know but that's kind of how you see that and and I think ASC you know over time has started to is it has started to respond to that and I think you know obviously we'll get into what the pushback has been on 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 you know responding to the community you were actually supposed to serve but maybe that's just me I don't know. No, no, yeah, that that that's right. And and you know, ASC, yes, we started out funding eight organizations, but over our 60 plus years, mm-hmm. we have um, especially in operating support, you know, we have opened that door to support organizations like Jazz Art Charlotte, um, a sign of the times of the Carolinas, Goodyear Arts, um, Chaos, who does the Boom Festival, so and cl- to Clay Works. So it's really important that we're, um, for me, equity is about everyone having the resources that they need Mm -hmm. to move along together. That's one piece of equity. So we're, you know, really committed to that, um, committed to doing that work. Absolutely. And and just another example about history of inequitable funding, if you could advance the slide, Christina. This is just an example that I... um, tend to lift up and it's actually lifted up in um, in beyond the sound bites. So again, people were not reading the reports, they were listening to the media sound bites of ASC's apology. And so we decided to say, we need to have a community conversation about and do a deeper dive in the report. And so um, we did have a live session of beyond the sound bites. It is on our YouTube channel um, and it was hosted, graciously hosted by Dr. Tom Hanchett, who is a histor- historian here in Charlotte, and Janine Bryant, who is an education equity advocate. But in this story, in this session, um, you know, we tell the story by looking at the data between Afro-American Children's Theater and Children's mm-hmm. Theater of Charlotte. So yes, Children's Theater was one of the original eight um, that were started receiving funding of ASC. And then Afro-American Children's Theater that was founded by um, Ms. Barbara Ferguson um, uh, became came to be a, be, begin receiving operating support from ASC in fiscal year um, 92. And so, but when, but when we look at the data and between those 13 years of when Afro-American Children's Theater was there, between Children's Theater of Charlotte, and then when they stopped receiving funding, you'll see right here, Um, the comparison of inequitable funding. Here you have two children's theaters. One happens to focus on African-American culture and stories, um, but this is the end result. $508,000 in that 13 years and then 3.1. So these are examples of what does not need to happen again. To me, this is an example of the lie at work. I have had conversations with Ms. Ferguson and just learning more about all that they had to deal with and go through and, and, and that there was a lot of marching to Arts and Science Council's offices um, to say, why, why weren't we not included? Um, one quick story is they received um, they received a license to do the WIS for two years. Hmm. So they did it one year and then the next year the Arts and Science Council decided that we're gonna do something around the world of Oz. So everything related to the Wizard of Oz. So gave grants to Discovery Place, they were doing something science related to Oz, Children's Theater, et cetera. But the Afro American Children's Theater was left out when they had this two year lease to do the WIS. So, you know, again, she, there was a lot of marching, demanding for funding and resources. They ended up get, you know, getting that funding for to be part of the world of Oz. But again, the exclusion, who matters more than others? Who's at the table making the funding decisions? And so that's just an example of our history that, that should not um, happen, happen again. Yeah, that does play into sort of our, our sort of implicit assumptions, right? I think mm-hmm. that, you know, um, like, like that idea of like implicit bias, right? You know, that, that even within the arts, there's certain, you know, like, uh, of course we're going to fund, you know, the opera, right? Because, that you know, when, when, when you know, like you watch the cartoons when I was a kid, you know, where, where's Bugs Bunny? He's at the opera, right? You know, he's, you know, it's not at some community-based art gathering or culturally different, you know, it's, it, our, our minds are kind of, kind of hardwired. Well, maybe not hardwired, because that'd be, that'd be hopeless. We were hardwired, but at least initially programmed, you know, with this idea that 
there's higher art and there's like a lower art. And then obviously there's a racial component to that, a class component to that. And I think that, um, I mean, I mean, but, but, you know, there's an old saying in basketball, the ball doesn't lie, right? You know, your statistics say, you know, tell you whether you're a good shooter or not. This kind of tells you, you know, uh, there's an equity here, right? Because if you understand right. the definition of equity, it kind of says, says it right there. Right. And, and, and I do think about, you know, um, I do want to say it, it, the legacy organizations, they are important mm -hmm. and they should have the funding that they need to, you know, to grow and to do their work. Um, however, to me, you know, they don't matter more than a jazz art Charlotte, than an Afro-American children's theater, um, because we want to see the new and emerging organizations of today to have the resources that they need to become a major organization like a Mint Museum or, you know, an opera. Mm -hmm. And I always think about, you know, if that funding was done in an equitable way, what mm -hmm. could be today, what you know, happen? what would right. Afro-American Children's Theater look like and be, you know, serving, serving today? So that's, um, that's just an, an example. And all of the legacy organizations are doing great work. They are kind of looking at their, you know, how to become more equitable um, themselves. So I just want to make make sure that I am clear on that. And they do great work and deserve funding as well. Maybe that's an issue because I think that sounds like, you know, with COVID, you know, and in the recession, even from like, like 12, 13 years ago, I mean, I did read that overall funding has 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 dried up somewhat you know i mean that's and i think that you know it's almost like i mean obviously probably the the quickest answer would be we just need to just get a lot more money into the space for everybody but it's almost like in a situation where there's diminishing returns then people are there whatever they believe is starting to come out right because you prioritize you start to make you know decisions based on 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 the finances in a in a, in a certain respect um, but, you know, I do think that, I mean, you know, if, if, if you have a, you know, kind of what we had talked about, you know, if, 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 if a community, if a city, if a county, if a region, you know, if the ethos is being put out there that we are going to commit ourselves to equity, you know, you came on on my other platform leadership series, we did a discussion about diversity, equity, inclusion, just in the nonprofit sector itself, you know, um, if we're going to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, what are our actions, what are our, you know, what are, you know, and, and I think that much of what I see out of the story here is, um, you know, again, is the disconnect between sort of the, the language of diversity, equity, inclusion, and of course, um, the actual funding, the actual yeah. doing that is, that, is, that is happening here. And so, you know, I think um, that that's, uh, I, I think that's, that's kind of a, a key thing, because like you said, when when the when they got into the news and when I read it, you know, I, I all I saw was ASC has just been a really bad organization and they've never funded anybody and they're getting what they deserve. You know, I mean, that's that's kind of like, you know, as a as regular person, you know, just reading the Charlotte News, that's kind of what I walked away with, you know, yeah. until I, I actually started to I talked to you. I just I read more and I was like, well, you know, there's more to this story. And that's why I thought it'd be great to kind of open up the story a little bit more for, you know, for, uh, to, to get beyond, like you said, to get beyond that said sound bites. And the sound bite, yeah. So, so, you know, the cultural sector has been kind of in free fall, or I would say, you know, kind of hemorrhaging since 2008 right. um, with the Great Recession. How we've been able to build the cultural sector is because, is then the primary vehicle has been through workplace campaigns. Mm. We, it, and they were, um, so much so that, you know, ASC was one of the, was the, you know, was the number one, um, you know, ran the number one United Arts Fund in the country. We would raise a lot of, uh, like, $11 million in, you know, six to, you know, six to eight weeks, and then distribute that, distribute that funding in community. Um, but in 2008, you know, with the Great Recession, we have never been able to recover from that. We also, workplaces are changing. Their employees want to give to different things. Again, if people that have been in the community for a long time may remember it was United Way in the fall and ASC, a dedicated United Way campaign in the fall and ASC campaign in the, in the winter or spring. And so, um, and so we, we did, there was a task force done about the financial health of the sector in 2014. And we said, we need a dedicated revenue stream mm -hmm. for the cultural sector because these groups, all groups, just the sector needs stability. 
because again, we're, we're not recovering and things are getting, getting worse. And so that's when, you know, we tried the referendum several times. Mm -hmm. The last time was in 2019 with the sales tax referendum that also included parks and greenways and uh, pay for teachers. And the voters decided they did not want to fund, um, you know, to fund it in that way. We did learn there's a lot of support for the sector. They just mm -hmm. didn't want to fund it through a sales tax. Interesting. Yeah, so I, now, mm -hmm. yeah, I was going to just say, because I, I mean, that was when I sort of returned to Charlotte. I had been kind of out of Charlotte in 17 when the law school was, was like, oh, and I can't, I finally got myself back into Charlotte right around that time when the referendum was, was coming up. And I thought in my head, you know, no, no refer, everyone votes for it because all the housing trust, fund, all that stuff always like, you know, goes up. I mean, I mean, I don't know. What do you think contributed to it not, not working out for it? Because that would have been a game changer for everybody in the art sector if that would have gone through, I think. Well, the, the challenge with the challenge with the re, with the referendum, it was challenges from the beginning. The first one was the ballot language. Right. Um, the ballot language literally just said, "Do you support an increase in sales tax?" Well, oh, that's not. Good. It did not say <laughs> what it was going to support. That it was supporting the yards. That it was supporting teacher pay. That it was supporting you know investments in parks and greenways. So we had a challenge with that from the beginning. Mm. Um, and I and I think. Just, um, I think people just did not want to fund it that way. And I think also that was the last time if you, if you, oh, the other thing was that the county commissioners, you know, it could change. I mean, if you yeah. get a new board of county commissioners, they could say, well, we want the sales tax to go towards, I don't know, something else. Because it'd be under the power not, of the county commission, right? Just because you raised it. And if it's so amorphous, it just says you want to raise the sales tax and you're not dedicating it to a certain purpose. Because I know when the housing trust fund is up, you know, it says you want more money for housing, uh, you know, low income, affordable housing. People are like, oh, OK, that sounds good. I don't mind paying extra half cent. But if you see something on the ballot that says you want your taxes raised, maybe that's what we're saying. Yes, it basically, I don't know yes. No. <laughs> yes, it had for or against. Do you support a quarter cent sales tax increase? Da, 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 da. So that's, it yeah, didn't that, say, that, you know, just, that, that's almost just like basically um, just prepping you guys to fail. I mean, that, that, that was yeah. that was that was so, wrong. That's yeah, so that's, that was the big hurdle, but that language was written by the legislature in the state. Uh, state well, government. yeah, the legislature not exactly a fan of uh, <laughs> our community, uh, whether it's the county or the city. I don't think, you know, even I know the city and county does this, but Raleigh just yeah. kind of just you know, kind of only aims at both of them. <laughs> yeah, but we're, but we're very grateful that the county commissioners approved to, you know, put it on the ballot and let, yeah. you know, let the voters decide. And right now, what's going on with the city is that I know they're trying to get to a dedicated revenue stream, I think, through right. a tourism, a tourism tax. So if, if Christina could go up one slide to the previous slide regarding um, funding, this is my concern around the city situation is that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I'm happy there is more money for the sector because right. we have been advocating for increased funding for a long time and even from the city because the city would give ASC $3.1 million and we'd always advocate for more because the funding has not kept up pace with the population growth to be able right. to serve them. So I'm very happy there's increased money for the sector. I know foundation has raised additional matching dollars. And so, um, you know, my concern, and I've publicly said this, is that, you know, um, I, we don't need to get back to inequitable funding as it relates to operating support. And my concern is that the city is, a, ha, the narrative has been around, this is to restore the health of Uptown Charlotte. This is to support the organizations in city-owned facilities. There are only five in city-owned facilities. The Blumenthal, the Gantt, the Mint, the Beckler, and Discovery Place. So when this all came about, the, all this talk about city-owned facilities, I said, well, what about Theater Charlotte? They're not a city-owned facility. What about Carolina Raptor Center in Huntersville? What about Davidson Community Players or Matthews Playhouse that was receiving fund and operating support funding from ASC? I was really fearful that they were going to be left out. Right. So there's a lot of advocating to include, if you're going to do this, do all of, all of the organizations that were receiving operating support from ASC. Um, because again, we're here to serve the sector, not just uptown. And, um, and, and in the manager's memo, um, the Marcus Jones, the city manager's memo, it stated in there that, you know, we're going to fund the 37 organizations right. that get operating support from ASC 
at FY20 or FY21 levels, whichever is greater. Okay. And I have, and that's in writing. And I always said, well, greater for whom? Because an example is the Mint Museum in FY20 received over $926,000 in operating support from ASC. And the Gantt Center received, I think, $178,000 in operating support from ASC. For FY21, we, we instituted our equity lens. And again, with the resources that financial resources we had, the Gantt went up to $201,000 and the Mint went down to $500,000. And so, you know, the fact that now this has shifted back to this fiscal year, the Gantt, the, uh, the Mint is back up to 926,000 and the Gantt is at 201 and they only got an extra $130,000, $50,000 but you're dealing with like $12 million. Mm -hmm. We only had $4 million to work with. So my concern is that it's just this knee jerk reaction back mm -hmm. to, you know, who's going to get, who's, who's going to get more and who's not when you have more money to work with. Mm -hmm. no, and, I mean, and, I, and I truly believe the Gantt should be getting more money. You have two organizations right across from each other, not excluding the Beckler, because that's something different, mm -hmm. but you know, why is one getting three hundred thousand dollars and the other one nine hundred twenty six? So, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, also the other thing is that they say they're they're you know they want stabilizing of the stabilization of the sector and we want that, but if you have these dollars secured for three years, why not go ahead and commit to say we're committed to funding because the funding these organizations and more for the three years for stabilization and right now. It's only guaranteed, funding is only guaranteed for those 37 organizations for one year, including for ASC, the funding that we received. And so, you know, they're putting together this board and I'm just yeah. really concerned mm -hmm. about who's going to be on the board, who's at the table, who's not at the table, who's making the funding decisions so that we don't get back to this so, example. So maybe we can help clarify what, what has gone. So uh, obviously we you had the cultural equity report. I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to play conspiracy if they you did this report that all of a sudden, you know, you guys got funding taken from you. I, I, you didn't hear that from me, but you know, but but to those in the audience, you know, I think obviously up until this the shift. So there's been a, a monumental shift in the way arts funding, you know, typically happens. So prior to the shift, money you were the ASC was the leading funder of arts in Charlotte. Period. You know, and yes. and so could you explain to the audience what has this what shift either done by the city and or the or whatever what will funding changes what will the landscape of arts funding look like and who's or at least to whatever to, to what level you know what the, you know the the new sort of uh uh uh, uh clearing house i don't know what, what it's gonna look like sure. so um so so the city you know is taking on um you know, a big portion of funding the arts and cultural sector and really around operating support grants to help organizations keep the light on, you know, pay, pay people. Um, and, they've, and they've given that those dollars out this fiscal year to those 37 organizations. They're still sitting on about 4.3 or 4.6 um, uh, $4 million dollars to determine, this board to determine how those dollars are going to be distributed. We did receive um, funding from the county. I saw some increased funding from the county. For example, for our culture blocks work that we do in partnership with the library and park and rec centers. And that is really listening and learning from residents in the community about the experiences that they want and then delivering those experiences close to where they live through park, parks and libraries. So grateful for that. We've got increased funding for creative individuals from the county. Um, and other things. So um, I'm really appreciative that the county supports our work. We did get 1.2 million from the city, 800 for our operations and 500,000 for our grant making. Um, so, you know, and again, we're still doing private fundraising, but that continues to be a challenge for us through the workplace giving model. So right. really trying to shift and make relationships with, um, with individual donors to really understand and support our work. So I don't know. And the other thing is that the city is going to create a cultural plan mm -hmm. and they're hiring this, uh, this arts and cultural commissioner that's only there, that position is there for three years to do this plan and to, I guess, figure out the things for the three years. And so, um, you know, I don't know what that work is going to be, but ASC, I will say, number one, we are committed to cultural equity. We are committed to serving the residents of Charlotte Mecklenburg first. 
and um, and really investing in the people, programs, and ideas that move us toward a more equitable, sustainable, and innovative, creative um, ecosystem. And I will say the other thing is that we will still have a relationship with the legacy organizations. Um, I think this has caused a lot of confusion in the city situation, but we have provided technical assistance grants. We provide workshops and trainings for them. So this is not just a cutoff um, from the um, organizations that we have supported for many years. Yeah, it, it does seem like, and again, you know, obviously if there was more than enough money to go around, maybe we would pack less of the pressures that, that we're seeing here. But it does seem like there's kind of competing visions of the art scene, or at least maybe there's multiple ones, but at least, or, or am I, am I not? No, no, no the, the city has clearly, you know, to me, and then if you listen to past meetings and even our, you know, news reports that have not been asked to be retracted, is that the city is focused on its positioning this as economic development. Right. They want people from outside of the, of the city mm -hmm. to come into the city for tourism. Right. This is about tourism and also helping organizations in the city owned facilities and organizations that perform in those facilities. So that's how you rope in the symphony, the opera, mm -hmm. ballet, et cetera. So they're about to me, you know, uptown Charlotte and right. residents that are not, people that are not residents of the city first. ASC is committed to serving residents first and across Mecklenburg County. And uh, the other thing is a lot of it is around, um, we wanna fund organizations of the future. Just the example I said, we, we know that there are grassroots organizations mm -hmm. that reflect the population doing great work that we, they need to be invested in to, for them to build their capacity and grow to become you know, a major organization if they want to. Mm -hmm. The other piece of this, if, if Christina can go two more slides, our investment in creative individuals are really important. Creative individuals are the lifeblood of the sector, as I've mentioned before. And so um, we've established new grant programs and fellowships to support creative individuals. Here you see our recipients of our Creative um, Renewal Fellowships Program and Emerging Creative Fellows. And those are $10,000 awards to local creatives. Um, and FY20, 43% of them were artists of color. Um, for the renewal fellowships and for emerging creative fellows in FY20, those were $5,000 awards, 75% were artists of color. Um, we have, invet we have, yeah, thank you for advancing the slide. We have invested our resources to support more creative individuals from $50,000 in 2016 to over $500,000 um, because creative individuals are important. They are the ones that activate spaces they are the ones about building community. They are also, you know, we want them to live and work here um, in our community um, as well. So that's just an example. This is also in the report that shows, you know, the investment and things that we are doing. So, you know, we're, we've restructured our grant programs. We launched culture blocks. Um, we started these emerging fellowships and creative renewal fellowships to support creative individuals. We also provide workshops and trainings around issues of diversity, white supremacy, equity, and inclusion. And again, all of this is guided through our board approved um, cultural equity statement. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I know we have to open it up for questions, if you can advance the slide is, you know, two weeks ago, I went to Mallard Creek Recreation Center. And as part of our cultural blocks experience, this uh, visual you see here is um, the purple Charlotte steppers uh, we fund them to provide dance classes and really around kind of ballroom dance classes. Hmm. Well, this particular, this particular class was for residents in our community that are visually impaired. So on the right, you see um, a woman named Shamika that I met that day. And the woman on the left with the hat, wearing the hat is Joe. And, the, and they are visually impaired. And at Kevin in the middle is the instructor. And he has also has um, some visual impairments. But it was wonderful to see that, you know, this, this um, experience was happening in our community and it is including those in our community that are visually impaired and they giving them the opportunity um, to dance and to learn. And I even learned some ballroom steps as well. But Shamika was so excited and shared her story that when she woke up one day and just could not see, was really shut in her, um, in her apartment for six months and realized with encouragement from others that I just can't live my life this way. I have to move forward with my life. And mm -hmm. I'm very happy that 
culture, the, the county invest in culture blocks of our partnership with Mecklenburg County and Parks and Recreation so that we are able to, um, to invest in creative individuals and organizations to provide experiences that include everyone and also that is equitable, that is mm-hmm. across our community. Yeah, no, I think that, um, you know, I, I think that definitely, obviously, you know, that old saying, it is what it is, right? You know, where, what has happened has happened. And I think um, knowing more, so it sounds like ASE, you are, and, and, and to your credit and, and to your board's credit is, you know, you put forward an equity statement, you put forward a cultural equity, you know, a report, which I think you will continue to put out. And, um, you know, you're you're going to live by it. And I think that's, you know, I mean, in this day and time where, you know, I think people's alliances or, or something shift or, or something based on the quote unquote political wins, you know, I think that's, that's quite admirable to see an organization, a leadership, a leader, a board that is really, you know, I mean, really just sticking to your proverbial guns. I don't want to say guns all the time, but, you know, uh, but, you know, that, and, and I think that's, I, I think that you guys, I think that your organization and, and what's going on is a story with the art scene, you know, that it's that, yes, having a strong uptown and, and, and all these things, it's economic development and tourism. But, you know, on the, the other platform, this when we talked this this week, you know, we, we talked about um, affordable housing. And it's and there's a saying that says community development precedes economic development. And I think really it's kind of a question, how do we want to see our community develop, right? Is it, right. Is it just solely, you know, tourism track like Orlando or something? And it's like, oh, we'll just hit the top level stuff. We'll check it off all the bucket list for visiting Charlotte and we're out the door. Or is it, you know, a more inclusive, holistic, this is the real Charlotte from, you know, from the East, you know, where the food right. is so diverse and everything is, yeah, I mean, I can't read half the stuff there, right? You know, you go yeah. you know, to, to the West where, you know, it's like got so much history and so much dynamism. Right. You know, I think it's, and, then, and that's what I was saying. It's like it, there's almost, uh, you know, a value question implicit in a lot of this, you know, a lot of these sort of policy decisions and maneuvering and things. Um, but, you know, again, I credit ASC and, you know, stick, you know, doing um, doing the work and, and, and you know, um, doing the way yeah, you did the work. I mean, and yes, I mean, there were some consequences to it. But at the same time, I think over in my opinion, I think over time, uh, history will vindicate you. Oh, well, well, thank you. And, you know, we're committed to, we're, we're not there yet. Again, it, it, this is an equity journey. It's it's an urgent journey, but it can't be an immediate. Um, things don't happen immediately. We are continuing to listen and learn and test things. But it's really, as um, a colleague of mine, Tariana, says, you know, you know, equity is not another program. You know, it's the why and the how. And the how are the steps that we're taking. And the why is that we're trying to achieve justice and by examining policies and practices and to make, you know, to make that change. It's not just about being awareness of racism and the role, you know, that government and others have played in in creating these systems and structures. Um, But it's like actively, actively doing the work and Mm -hmm. and listening and learning from that and, and being committed to it. All right. Well, you know what, we're right now around 10 minutes before the end of the hour. So I know that we 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 throw a lot to the audience today, so I think there's got to be some questions in in the audience today. So, uh, you know, please unmute yourself or or use the chat um, and uh, let's uh, share your thoughts or, or questions. You've got you know the very courageous Krista Terrell here, uh, and, and I'm, I know she's not afraid of questions. She obviously is telling the truth here. She she's going to take your questions, so uh, feel free to ask. Well, I think I see a question here in the chat uh, from Gregory. Um, with the challenges that you shared, what can the community do best to support ASC? Wonderful question. Yes, thank you for that question, Gregory. Um, I think that the best thing for, for the community to do is to, number one, really dig deeper and learn about the work that ASC is doing. We'd love to connect with you um, and, to, and to advocate and to advocate about the funding that we need so that we can do our work and invest in an equitable way to achieve cultural equity. Um, What I have learned and I know is that 
while the city had the situation has caused a lot of confusion i've had to do a lot of resetting because the brand of asc for so many years was around operating support mm -hmm. we always you know invested in you know cultural education creative individual etc but the big the uh, the macro level was all about um operating support and the fact that we are no longer in that business and the city is taking that on mm -hmm. which is fine um that frees us up to do to to do more of the what we're doing and different new things. So we'd love to connect with you and really need the community to um, be intentional to learn about our work. We wanna connect with you to be able to advocate um, for the funding and connections with community that we need to do this work. Okay, I see and comment. to donate, and to do, you know, of course, yeah. also and, donate, support and, ASD. Yeah, so just remember, make a gift. Arts and Science Council is a 501c3 public charity, so uh, donations are deductible on your taxes. And so um, I, I like to, I told you, I'll make, I'll, I'll do the ask for you, is that if you want to, and obviously you've heard what they're doing, you've seen the financial kind of shift that has occurred. So I think if, if anything, ASC is going to be going to the community a lot more because you're serving the community. And I think it is, it is worthy ask of the community to give that support back as well. Um, because money doesn't just like, you know, it, it, needs to, it needs to come from somewhere. And obviously, you know, with the new shift in the paradigm of funding, a lot of the corporate donors and all the foundations that had been kind of in ASC's corner going somewhere different now, you know, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I can't control that. But I, the community in and of itself, you know, um, can support because it, it's got to be a symbiotic relationship. The ASC is in the community and the community needs to be with the ASC as well. Um, so, um, what, what's the website? And, and I know like you can um, it's, it. Yeah, it's oh. artsandscience.org, and all spelled out, A-R-T-S-A-N-D-S-C-I-E-N-C-E.org, artsandscience.org. And um, I see a, a comment here, uh, and it's from Christy the Library, it says, enjoyed and embraces culture blocks at our branches around Mecklenburg County. Maybe, could we learn a little bit more about culture blocks? I feel like it's a very popular Thing, and maybe folks in the audience may want to know how to kind of connect to Culture Blocks. Sure. So Culture Blocks was created, uh, I think, in 2017 um, because we, we and it aligns with the county's priorities of bringing Mecklenburg County to you these services. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we had tra transactional data about who um, had a connection to the cultural sector of the organizations that we were funding. Okay. And so it's interesting when you do, when we looked at that data and laid it over the county map, you know how you see the crescent as it relates to education mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, economic, uh, social, socioeconomic status. It was the same thing for the arts and cultural sector. You had the wedge and you had the crescent. Mm -hmm. And again, this was based on transactional data. Um, of people who, who engage with, this, with the organizations we support. So what we decided to do was to say, we're going to go into various communities, targeted communities. We know they have a cultural life. We just want to connect them to all of these organizations and creative individuals that we support. And it, and one, and it connects to one of our values of community, of centering community and all that we do and lead by listening. Mm. So we don't go into the West side and say, hey, you need opera in your life. Go Opera Carolina, do a performance of like Porgy and Bess or something. We listen and learn about the things that they want to see and then respond by investing in those creative individuals and organizations to go in there, build relationships and do and do programming so if you go to asc's website and go to programs for by community for community you'll see culture blocks and you'll also see the priorities of those various blocks um of the things that they want to see and how people can connect with them of course we're in covid we're doing a lot of stuff um virtually but that's what culture blocks is about it's about responding to community um and the things that, that they want to see yeah and yeah. it's been it's been wonderful because um, Tosco uh, Music Party mm -hmm. was involved. We had them at University City. Uh, we've had uh, a violinist that stood outside and played the violin as you walked in. We've had um, Charlotte a Dance Theater, uh, ballet, uh, mm -hmm. a ballerina come in. Uh, the, I believe. Um, the pottery. Pottery, the Charlotte, uh, the drumming. We had yes. drumming. That was fun. <laughs> that was fun. We did realize that we probably need to put them outside the library. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, but I, it really does 
you know, especially, I mean, even people that work for the library are not able to be exposed to a lot of this kind of culture. It's even out of the way for some of us, you know, mm -hmm. so to be able to have it brought into a, a space like the library that is visited by all different kinds of people. I feel like that was such a gift, you know, it was wonderful, you know, so thank you very much for this. And I really hope that it does continue. And with the, you know, even with COVID having things outside, you know, I hope that we could somehow continue those culture blocks because they were so important. So thank yes. you. Yes, you're welcome. And and it's interesting when you mentioned about clay works and to Rob uh, to now I know it's Robin's uh, Robin Massey's question is, you know, there's a story that that around around clay works at um at one of the library branches, Hickory Grove, where a woman named Jen and her and her father was suffering from um, dementia, but working with clay helps him with his motor skills. And it was an opportunity for her and her daughter and her father to build and spend time together pre-COVID. But um, that was just a wonderful story that says like, this art sector is not just for entertainment. It also connects to mental health. It helps with mobility. It's all, it builds social capital. I mean, even in the Leading on Opportunity report, it note, clearly noted out that the arts and cultural sector is the best way to build social capital uh, for children, youth, and adults. And we got any other questions? Go ahead, unmute yourself, hop in. Water's fine. Or maybe not. Um, well, it looks like uh, we are getting towards the end here. Um, so what I would just like to say, again, first of all, thank you so much for coming on to this day's Fridays with Rocky, uh, Krista. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, it's really important to kind of see, obviously this wasn't, I, you know, I don't think this our intent was just to sit there and throw things and say, this is what's wrong with things, but just, we have to have the truth, right? You have to have the truth, you have to know, because you're not going to have a full understanding of, of where you're going to go until we, we kind of have that. But at the same time, you know, I applaud, you know, ASC for your efforts and again, becoming more community oriented, you know, intentionally, you know, rooting yourself and becoming almost with, uh, with you know, with humility in a sense, coming to these communities and, and really wanting to be a true partner as opposed, you know, and, you know, and, and, and really building a, a true relation, which I, like I said, I think many years from now, when you see the roots and the seeds that are really kind of there, you're going to really see something that's, that's, that's really, really powerful um, in this community. And um, what I'll say a plug for, you know, uh, just, just community-based nonprofits, you know, um, I've, I've had the privilege to work with a few, I'll give some shout outs to the South End Arts and Talking Walls Festival and uh, mm -hmm. Brand the Moth, you know, uh, those are my, so support them too. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, is that, that Charlotte and Mecklenburg County is so rich and diverse in arts and culture. And I just want to say that again, it is so rich and diverse in arts and culture. And you're doing yourself and your community a disservice by not just, don't get me wrong, if you find yourself in uptown, and you're gonna to go to go. I mean, I mean, art is art is art, but yeah. there are so much, you know, it, there, it, it's like, imagine like the greatest food court you've ever been to, right? With everything you could ever want. Charlotte's art scene is very similar from its music to its, obviously to its painting, to, the, you, know, the, you know, the public art to everything. And, and you know, the, with the creatives, you know, the individual creatives, you know, it, Art doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from the grassroots. It comes from the, the people. And so to whatever extent that, you know, I know on another platform we're talking, you know, with uh, Art Pop, we talked about, you know, support local artists, right? If you see something you really like, you don't have to buy something. You don't have to buy everything from Ikea or Target, you know, buy a local piece of art, you know? Um, and, and just, you know, again, uh, feel, you know, I know arts and science can connect you just to give you the, there's just a long laundry list of, of organizations out there that need support and are doing phenomenal work and and and, and not just you know it just just wonderful eye-opening things that are out there and so art is not just i mean don't get me wrong uh you know art is on uptown so we, there's art on, there's plenty of it it's large and it's in charge but open your minds and know that charlotte mecklenburg from through even to 
street corners to other parts of you know to the east to the south there's so much so much art and 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 i think that so much arts and culture and i think it's the people who make the community in my opinion i think that um kind of connecting to to that and if there's any kind of takeaways just know um that uh, be open and try to explore and it, you know obviously we got this delta but it's not going to be here and you know we're, we're going to get back outside full full time full force in and um use that time to really really get into the arts and culture scene and, and such so um that's that's all i can say krista do you have any parting words for our, our audience here because i always leave the last word to the guest well, no, I just um, thank you again for the, for the opportunity. Um, I think the biggest challenge that we're facing right now with COVID is, you know, the sector, we were the first to go dark and we'll probably be the last to reopen fully because the nature of our business is about being together, is about gathering and sharing experiences together. So we are continuing to do the... Um, you know, doing the best we can. The organization is trying to navigate. Again, many of you may have heard about the, you know, Charlotte Shout has been postponed due to, you know, the Delta variant. And so I think about the artists that, you know, they, they've lost a lot of work during this pandemic. Um, so um, any way you can support artists, any way you can connect with them, organizations, charlotteculturguide.com is, I'll put it in the chat, is another, um, resource to connect with the cultural sector and to sign up for culture picks. But um, I just encourage everyone to just learn more about ASC and the work that we're doing. And we really want to build a relationship with you, um, with you and to, and to be able to serve you. All right, everyone have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for Thanks, joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.